As I discovered, the SE207XT fits like Cinderella's slipper with the Sliger S620. The fan at the back is pretty much flush with this case while attached to the heatsink still. But it's the stuff under the cooler that we'll be discussing today, so let's get ready to split some hairs. Welcome to Machines and More. There's a lot of coolers that have been tested on the channel and I might do a video about this case and this cooler soon, but none of these coolers would work well without this stuff here, all right? Thermal interface material or TIM is something that fills in the gap between your cooler's base plate and your CPU's integrated heat spreader. Like it or not, liquid or air cooling, your cooler will never be a perfect match to your CPU's surface. And even if you lap that surface, there's still going to be small microscopic surface variations to fill. And TIM bridges that gap and ensures that there is good contact between the surface of the CPU and the cooler's base plate. And that allows heat transfer to happen effectively. Now it comes in many forms. There are graphite thermal pads, conductive liquid metal, and the topic of today's comparison, which is what you'll encounter most often in the PC building world, non-conductive thermal paste. So I gathered a few popular varieties of thermal paste available as an aftermarket purchase. Some of these were sent in from their respective manufacturers, a big thanks to them, and some of these I just had on hand already, so I just tested it. The ones I'll be comparing today will be Arctic's MX4, the new Arctic MX-5, Noctua's NTH-1, Thermal Grizzly's Cryonaut, and Scythe Thermal Elixir 2. Now, MX-4 has been one of my personal favorites for some time now. It's carbon-based, easy to apply, and it spreads well. Four grams will run you about $7. Uh, this one here looks a little bigger, it's eight grams. It's followed by the newly released MX-5, which is also composed of carbon microparticles this one is bluish, it's a little bit runny, and interestingly, it does have a very high level of adhesion from what I discovered when removing the cooler, but the coverage is very good, and pricing is very similar, it's about the same as MX4, about $7 for four grams. If you've ever bought a Noctua cooler, this is typically the stuff that's bundled with it, this is Noctua's NTH1, their consumer level paste. Uh, there is another level called NTH2, but typically speaking, that's more of a paste where the benefit is with HEDT or larger CPU surfaces. And this one comes in a tube uh, for three and a half grams and runs about $8. So effectively for four grams, it's $9 or so. Thermal Grizzly's Cryonaut is a high-end paste from the German company. They designed this one for overclockers. Uh, this is an aluminum and zinc oxide based paste and it's pricey. One grams with a spreader runs about $10, so four grams worth will be $40. Last up in this comparison will be Scythe Thermal Elixir 2, SCTE 2000. This is aluminum particle based, and it's the same paste that's bundled with Scythe coolers. And typically you get about one gram with the Scythe coolers, but you can pick up a tube aftermarket for $10. So normalized to four grams is about $8. So it's worth noting that none of these require cure time. They're ready to go once applied and your cooler is tightened down properly. So obviously the most important metric here is the thermal performance of these pastes. And since these are all high performance products, what you're about to see are some very minor differences. And this is proverbial hair splitting, but if two pastes are identical, then so be it, right? Then you know that at least thermal performance isn't the main differentiating factor when choosing. Typically speaking, if it's within a degree, I consider it good enough and fun functionally identical. But at the same time, I did want to preserve the ordinal position of each thermal paste's performance based on our testing. So just a few notes on methodology since it's really important. Uh, for thermal testing, I like Blender. The run-to-run -run variations are minimal. It gives a real-world thermal load rather than some extreme AVX applications such as Prime95, which are really better for stability testing with overclocks, and this blender scene takes just over 11 minutes to run. Thermal pastes can and do perform differently based on the cooler base plate material. So for example, a lot of AIOs will have rougher copper surfaces. Air coolers can have machined or polished nickel surfaces, or in the case of direct contact heat pipe coolers, you also have a mix between copper surface and nickel surfaces. And high-end custom loop blocks will often feature a very highly polished nickel surface. 
So because of that, I am testing with both a copper base plate air cooler and a nickel base plate air cooler. I could only find one such cooler in the ID SE7, uh, SE207 XT for the copper base plate. And for the nickel plated base plate, I'm just using the Noctua U12A, pretty standard. I chose to use an air cooler just to minimize the variable of coolant temps and liquid flow rates. Uh, heat sinks have no moving parts, so there's no variable there. I am also testing in this case, the Sliger S620, but I did leave it completely open and two NFA12s by 25s uh, will do duty with fans locked at 100% for both coolers. Now the 5800X is a hot chip. AMD says that higher temperatures are the new normal, fine. Either way for the test, this chip averages at about 115 total package power for what is a slight all core OC of 4.65 gigahertz at 1.3 volts. In between each test, the thermal paste was removed both cooler and CPU surfaces were cleaned with rubbing alcohol and allowed to dry. And lastly, I realized there are fierce scholarly debates between application methods. There's team P-sized blob, team X, team X with dots, team line, team spatula, it's a slippery slope, right? Now typically for my own setups, I just go with the blob, hey team blob, and let the cooler pressure even it out, uh, unless the manufacturer specifies otherwise. But for this test, I did spread the paste into an even layer. And that's not saying that spreading is necessarily better performance wise, it just eliminates the risk that any missed pressure from the cooler somehow emits a corner or a section of the IHS which would amount to an unfair test. And of course, when removing and unmounting the cooler, I did check for that. And there weren't any issues for any of these tests, but if there was, I would have retested it. So let's get into the nickel plated surface first, the Noctua U12A here. And I did want to footnote that there are often synergies between the manufacturer's paste and cooler, but I did want to use a Noctua cooler since they are very popular amongst enthusiasts with very high base plate manufacturing quality. So apologies for the graph. That's just how close these are with a nickel plated base plate. So to make it easier to interpret the results, I did average out the final 100 seconds of the test. That makes it a little bit easier to read and take it for what you will. But the cryonaut does come out on top here, closely followed by MX4, MX5, and NTH1. And the only one with what appears to be a bigger gap is size paste. Still though, keeping in mind all these are within a degree so realistically speaking, there's very little between these for a high quality nickel surface. Skipping over to the copper base plate with ID Cooling's SE207 XT, where the surface with copper is usually rougher. So more gaps to fill here. And the results do shake up a bit and the differences here are more pronounced. For this one, I did include ID Cooling's stock paste and perhaps not surprisingly, the company's own thermal paste does work remarkably well performance wise and it's matched by the new MX5. And after that point, there's a bigger drop off and TH1 does appear to be okay for the copper base plate. Cryonaut and MX4, these three are a step behind. And finally, Scythe's paste appears to bring up the rear again here. Cryonaut, which was really good for the nickel plating isn't terribly impressive here. It's kind of middle of the pack and MX-5 with this unique texture seems to be quite good here. So if you have an ID cooling cooler, chances are you already have pretty good pace for your cooler. I haven't seen where you can go out and buy this TG25 stuff, but I wouldn't do that anyway, because based on my experience, it does become dry pretty quickly and doesn't seem to last very well. Kind of gets flaky after just a little use. So I would choose something a little more durable. So based on the results and experience applying each paste, uh, they're all quite close as expected. And if you're already using one of these pastes or if it came stock with your cooler, then I don't see a huge compelling reason to change it before it's time to change it. But cost is a big factor here. I think Thermal Grizzly's Cryonaut is a good paste and it's what I like to use on my custom loop blocks, but it does appear to be mediocre on rougher surfaces and it's really pricey. I mean, one of these things is not like the other, right? That's tiny compared to what you can get for the same price. And yeah, it's a tough recommendation because of its size and cost. Now, size paste is also decent and priced decently, but just keep in mind, it was marginally outperformed by the other pastes here. Arctic's MX4 is tried and true. I have always liked this one. Price is good. There is still 
a very competitive product in this today. And TH1 is also one I like. If you get it with your Nocto cooler, I just keep using it. It's very good stuff and fairly priced too as an aftermarket product. But I will pick a single strong recommendation that happens to also be one of the cheapest paced here. It gives excellent performance on both copper and nickel surfaces, and I would expect very good durability. And I'm very, very impressed with the new MX-5. I've been using this stuff longer term with my own U9S setup since it first launched a few months ago, and I like it a lot. And whether it's a nickel plated cooler or a copper cooler, performance appears to be equally good. But I think the most important factor here for the consumer is that it's actually a bit runny. It actually flows very well, maybe a little too well since it can splash onto your mobile when you're uh, putting it on the CPU, but just be careful and wipe it off. This viscosity helps reduce the chance of an improper application. So regardless of what team you're on, you should be able to get a very foolproof install. And I think this one will last quite well without drying out. So there you have it, lots of hair splitting data for you guys to consider. And hey, I'm kind of curious, what pace do you swear by? Have you tried MX-5 yet? Share your thoughts in the comments down below. Give a like, subscribe if you haven't yet. And I do have links down below for the test system and the paste. So please go ahead and check those out. Thanks for watching today and see you again soon.